In this lesson, we are going to continue our study of quantified statements. Statements involving multiple quantifiers are quite common in mathematics. For such statements, it is important to understand how the quantifiers interact and to be able to analyze the truth values of the statements. We begin with two examples that demonstrate that the order in which quantifiers occur is important. Let us consider the following statement. For all x in R, there exists y in R such that x is greater than y. So in words, this is saying that for each real number x, there is a real number y such that x is greater than y. What is this saying? This is saying that if this is the set of real numbers and if we get an arbitrary x here, there is always a corresponding y such that your x is greater than y. So take note here that the y depends on the choice of x. So that is if x is equal to 5, we can take y to be 4. If x is equal to 6, we can take y to be 2.5. There are many possible y's. However, to generalize this, we can just say that if we get an arbitrary x in R, we can take y to be equal to x minus 1. x minus 1 is always less than x. And of course, x minus 1 is a real number. So it satisfies this property. This statement is true. For any real number, we can always get a number smaller than it. So that is an interpretation of this statement without mentioning the variables x and y. Let us suppose that we interchange the order of the quantifiers. This time around, we have there exists y in R such that for all x in R, x is greater than y. How do we translate this in English sentence? This is saying that there is a real number which is smaller than any real number. Again, there is a real number y such that it is always smaller than any real number. The difference of this statement with this statement is that this time around, the choice of y does not depend on the choice of x. This is saying that y works for all possible x. Is this statement true? Is there a real number which is smaller than any real number? This is false. We've seen earlier that this statement is true and this statement is false. Since they have different truth values, therefore they are not equivalent. This is saying that the order of the quantifiers are important. It changes the meaning of your statement. Let us first consider multiple quantifiers of this form. Suppose that we have an open sentence P of x, y. Take note, we already have two variables, so that's why we have two quantifiers. You always have to quantify the variables that you have in your proposition. This is an open sentence, and the domain of x is d, and the domain of y is e. The statement, for all x in d, there exist y in e such that p of x, y is true if for any given value of x, there is some particular y in e dependent, take note of this, dependent upon x, making the proposition p of x, y is true. This is saying that if this is our d and this is our e, again, if this is x1, this is x2, this is x3, suppose those are the elements of d, the choice of y will depend on the choice of x in d. So you can take y1, so this y1 corresponds to x1, y2 corresponds to x2, and y3 corresponds to x3. How do we determine if this statement is true? What you do is you get an arbitrary element of D. So that's why we are starting with let X be an element of D. And then we determine what choice of Y in E makes P of X, Y true. So for example, let us show that this statement is true. 
For all x in z, there exists y in z such that x minus y is equal to 10. z here is a set of integers. Let us interpret this statement without using the variables x and y. If this is saying that given any integer, there is another integer that is smaller than it by 10. Is this statement true? Let us recall that if for all starts first, the y depends on the choice of x. So thus, we start by taking an arbitrary element of z. And how do we choose our y? What is that integer which is smaller than x by 10? That is, you can get that if you just solve for y in this equation. So notice here that your y depends on the choice of x because you started with the quantifier for all. That is, if x is equal to 20, your y is equal to 10. If x is 25.5, your y is 15.5, and so on. Next, let us consider quantified statements wherein the existential quantifier comes first before the universal quantifier. When is this true? This is true if there is a particular x in d that makes p of x, y true for every y in e. Notice here that the choice of x is independent on the choice of y. This x works for all y. Meaning to say, if this is our d, if this is our e, whatever y you get here in e, let's call this y1, y2, y3, and so on, this particular x in d will always work for all of these elements. So x works for all y in e. How do we show that this statement is true? You have to determine a specific choice of x in d because this starts with there exists. Recall that to show that an existential statement is true, you have to just give an example. So that's why you have to take a specific value of x and show that that x will work for any choice of y in e. So let us show that this statement is true. There exists x in z such that for all y in z, x plus y is equal to y. This one is saying that we have to find an integer x such that x plus y is equal to y for any y in the set of integers. Without using the variables x and y, this is saying that there is an integer such that when you add it with another integer, you always get the integer back to itself. And what is that x? We can take x to be equal to 0. And this 0 works for any y. 0 plus y is equal to y for all integers y. And take note here that this 0 is independent of y. So to recap, whenever you see there exists for all statements, it is saying that there is one that works for all, whereas whenever you have for all there exists statements, it is saying that for each you can find one that works. Let us consider the following. A is a set containing 1, 2, 3. B is a set 2, 4, 6, 8, 9. Let us show that the following statements are true. Number 1. For all x, there is a y in B such that 2x is equal to y. Your x here belongs in A. Since the universal quantifier comes first, then that means that this choice of y depends on the choice of x in A. So if x is equal to 1, take y to be 2. If x is equal to 2, y is equal to 4. If x is equal to 3, y is equal to 6. And these values here, 2, 4, and 6, are all elements of b. If you want to generalize this, you can just say, let x be in a. That's the first step. And then number 2, take y to be equal to to x. Another example, there exists x in A such that for any y in B, x is a divisor of y. 
since the existential quantifier started first, this is saying that x works for all y. It is independent of the choice of y. What is that number in A such that it is a divisor of all of these numbers in B? Take x to be equal to 1. And then the second, show that it satisfies the proposition. 1 divides all the elements in B. 2, 4, 6, 8, and 9. Next, suppose that R star is a set of non-zero real numbers. Determine if the following are true or false. Number 1, for any non-zero real number, there is... A non-zero number such that uv is equal to 1. This v here depends on the choice of u because you started with for all. How do we show whether this is true or false? You get an arbitrary u which is non-zero and what will you take for v? That's for the second part. There exists a V. What is that V? Take V to be equal to what? That's 1 over U. Take note that V here is also another non-zero real number because U is not equal to 0. 1 over U exists. And of course, U dot V is equal to U times 1 over U, which is equal to 1. So this V here satisfies this open sentence here so therefore this statement is true next what if we interchange this is there exists v in r star is it true that there is a v which works for all u no this is false next for any real number there is an integer such that the integer is greater than the real number. Is it true that you can always find an integer which is greater than x? Yes. And how do we show that? We start with let x be a real number because we started with for all. And then what do we take for n? Take n to be equal to what? To make sure that we have an integer, I will just use x plus 1. This is the greatest integer function of x. And notice here that my n depends on the choice of x. So for example, if x is equal to 2.3, my n is the GIF of 2.3 which is 2 plus 1, so that's 3. Let's say if x is 2.9, my n is also equal to 3 because the GIF of 2.9 is also 2 plus 1, so you also get 3. And suppose if x is equal to 22.1, my n is equal to 22 plus 1, 23. So this statement is true. What about number four? There is a real number such that it is smaller than any integer. What is this saying? This is saying that there is a real number such that it is always smaller than any integer. If we plot that, it is saying that my x here, this is a real number, and it is always smaller than all the integers. That is, the set of integers has a lower boundary. This is false. There is no lower boundary in the set of integers. Let us go back to the unique existential quantifier. What is the meaning of the statement, there exists a unique x in D such that, P of x. First, this is saying that there exists an x in D such that P of x is true. So we have there exists an x in D such that 
p of x is true. However, we also want it that x is the only such element in D. That means that if there is another y in D for which p of y is also true, if p of y is true, then we should have that this y here should be the same as x. How will we include that in this quantified statement? Take note that this p of x is inside the scope of this existential quantifier. So what will we write here? And, so we have here p of x is true and if p of y is true, so we have p of y, then x must be equal to y. However, this is not complete. You have a variable y here, but you do not have a quantifier. What should be the quantifier for y? We have for all y in d. So we have this one and this one. So take note, what is this saying again? This is saying that this x in d must satisfy these two conditions. Number one, p of x must be true. And this implication is true. What is this implication saying? If there is a y in D for which P of y is true, then this y here must be the same as the x that we obtained here. We will make use of this equivalent statement later on when we are proving unique existential statements. But for now, just hang on with this one. Let us now consider multiple quantifiers of the same kind. So for example, we have these two statements for all x in R, for all y in R. x plus y is equal to y plus x. And the other one, what will happen if you interchange the order? Take note that when you translate this, this is just saying that for any real number x and for any real number y, their sum will be the same regardless of their order. And that is just the commutative property of addition. These two statements are true. Therefore, we write this as for all x, y in R because they both have the same domain. x plus y is equal to y plus x. What if we have the same quantifier, the existential quantifier? There exists an x in R. There exists a y in R such that x is greater than y. This is just an existential statement. And to show that it is true, you just have to give an example. So take x, let's say, to be equal to 0 and take y to be equal to negative 1. 0 is greater than negative 1. And... This statement is also the same as this statement. The order does not really matter if you have the same kind. So therefore, we have the following. If we have two universal quantifiers, then you can simply interchange the order. Same is true for your existential quantifier. Let us now translate the following statements into quantified symbolic statements. Number one, every non-zero real number is positive or negative. So how do we translate that? It starts with every. So you have the universal quantifier for every x in R star non-zero. It is saying that, let me first write it as x is positive or negative. So therefore this becomes x is greater than zero or x is less than 0. Next, every integer is greater than some integer. So I will start first. We have every integer. So we have for all x in z. I will first write x is greater than some integer. But this one here, you have the word sum. So it signifies the presence of the existential quantifier. So this means x is greater than y for some y in z. Therefore, we write this as for all x in z, there exists a y also in z such that x is greater than 
y. Next, number three, there is a smallest positive integer. So take note here that you have there is. So that means you have the existential quantifier. And that x must be a positive integer. So I will denote it by z plus the set of all positive integers. And this x here is the smallest positive integer. But what is the meaning if you are the smallest? That means that x is less than or equal to y, where y is a positive integer. So therefore, you have there exists x in z plus, and then you have for any y in z. So that means for all y in z plus, x is less than or equal to y. Is this statement true? Yes, there is a smallest positive integer. What is that? We take x to be equal to 1. The last thing that we want to do with quantified statements is to negate quantified statements with multiple quantifiers. How do we negate for all x in d, there exists y and e such that p of x? Take note that there is an implied parenthesis here. This is saying that the existential quantifier happens inside the scope of for all. All right, so when you negate this whole thing, we will just use what we know about negating quantifiers for all x becomes there exists x in d and then negate this whole thing. Negation of there exists y in e p of x. And then when we negate this, there exists y will become for all y in e and then negate p of x. Similarly, if you have started with there exists x and then for all y, you will just interchange there exists to for all and for all to there exist. So we now have the following equivalent statements. So again, this is just saying that negating a statement with multiple quantifiers involves nothing more than repeatedly negating quantified statements. So for example, let us negate this statement. For all x in R, for all y in R with x less than y, there is a z in Q such that x is less than z and less than y. Let us first imagine what this is saying. This is saying that if we get any two real numbers, x and y, with x being smaller than y, we can always find, so this is a real number, and this is a real number, we can always find a rational number in between these two. Let us first write it in symbolic form so that we can easily get its negation. So we have for all x in R, for all y in R. What is this saying? With x less than y, there exists z in Q such that x is less than z, less than y. This is saying that if x is less than y, then there exists a rational number such that z is in between x and y. Therefore, now we can negate it. This becomes for all x, for all y, this becomes there exists x, there exists y in R, and then negate this. The negation of x less than y implies there exists z in Q x is less than z, less than y. Let me just copy this. What is the negation of an implication? To negate an implication, you copy the premise, and then you have end, and then negate the conclusion. This should be q, by the way.
what is the negation of this part? This becomes for all z in q. And then what is the negation of z is between x and y? This statement means x is less than z and z is less than y. So therefore, the negation of this is z is less than or equal to x or z is greater than or equal to y. The negation is saying that there are real numbers x and y with x being less than y, but all rational numbers are either here or here. There is no rational number. That is the same as there is no rational number in between x and y. And this is exactly the opposite of what is happening here. So this is really the negation of this statement.